So hello and welcome. Happy Friday. Today is Friday, September 10th, and this is episode number 125 of Backyard Beekeeping Questions and Answers based on questions that people like you submitted over the past week. So we're going to go over those today. If you want to know what we're going to talk about, please look down in the video description below. There will also be some valuable links down there. And of course, item by item, topic by topic, what we're going to discuss today. So this is the way to be. So I'm glad you're here, whether you're viewing or by podcast at Podbean. It's called The Way to Be. Also, maybe you have a pressing question right now and you want to share it with your friends. You want to make some beekeeping friends, people that are polite and friendly, that don't put each other down, that share ideas and problems. You go to the Facebook group called The Way to Be. Facebook group, The Way to Be. You answer a couple of questions, saying how you heard about it, and then you get admitted into the private group, which you get to share stuff day or night, 24-7, and there's people in there from all over the world, super happy with that group, and we haven't even been in trouble with Facebook yet. That's saying something when it comes to a group. So, let's jump right in with the very first question, and this comes from Jared. Also says JJ here. Thank you for those Q&A sessions, and for the educational YouTube videos, I was wondering... What is the maximum length of an entrance into a hive box? I'd like to build a vertical tube that covers the entrance and opens up several feet, eight feet in the air. This way, the bees won't be flying so low in my property where kids play. How will building a long vertical tube entrance affect the bees? I've attached a diagram. So this is a very interesting question, and I'm glad it was asked because... Often the questions lead me into research and looking at other things. So I was thinking, eight feet, that's really long for some kind of entrance. And uh, that seems like a big challenge for the bees. But then I thought, you know what, when it comes to observation hives, science centers, nature centers, and places that have these elaborate observation hives, often in the middle of their featured exploration rooms where people are learning about everything. And then you see these clear tubes going up to the ceiling and along the ceiling and out. And I found one in there that was up to 18 feet long. So this is pretty interesting stuff. So what I'm gonna share with you right now is first the diagram that uh, Jared sent. So here's the diagram of what Jared wants to do. Here's your normal hive. And he wants to put an attachment on there with this tube that goes up and to get bees out of range of the little kids. So we already know that if your bee yard is in a congested area and you want to get your bees up and out and out of the way, stockade fences, solid fencing, things like that, those tend to be about six or seven feet tall. And in fact, there's a place uh, around us called Port Farms and they have the bee bungalow there. And in the bee bungalow, not only do they get to watch an awesome video introduction to the life cycle of the honeybee, which someone we all know created. Anyway, moving on. It has an exit from their observation hive out the back of the building, and there's just a little corral there of stockade fencing, and the bees fly straight out, up and over, and there's a parking lot there. Lots of people are walking around, and the bees don't interact with them, so this is an interesting deal. So actually, it's doable. If you can't put up a stockade fence or something like that, which in my opinion would be much better, what I decided to do was made my own sketch of it. Now this is not to say that my sketch or concept would be any better than what JJ submitted. But because the wheels were turning, I had some ideas and I thought I'd like to share them because maybe other people. So here's JJ's concept drawing. And then we'll zoom in a little bit to my drawing here. And I did a sketch today. So let's get close. Let's see. Do, 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 do. Right there. So this is what I was thinking about. Things to ponder. So first off, if you're gonna do this, we want a solid foundation. It can't move at all. So this thing should probably have pipes going into the ground. Should definitely support the weight of your hive. Here's an end view of the hive where the entrance would be. So the other thing is I decided, you know what, an inch and a half diameter entrance would be optimum. And I'd like you to make that hole up off the bottom board. So that in the wintertime, if dead bees accumulate down here, they won't plug your entrance because that's the other part. But Fred, what if the pipe entrance gets plugged? Well, that's interesting that you say that too, because this is called a Charlotte fitting. And what we have here is the entrance goes through a reducer, and now we're up to a three inch PVC fitting 
And what's directly in line with it there? That's right, it's a clean out plug. So you could pull off this cap and have access to clean out the entrance so the bees don't get plugged. Now, another thing that people talk about is when you have this vertical climb here. So this is a 10 foot section of PVC pipe. Obviously we cut it down so we can get that eight foot height that JJ was asking about. But why not just make this into a one inch tube, for example? Well, glad you should ask, because if it's a three inch diameter pipe that goes up, which is pretty common, you also have the option to do a four inch pipe. Bees don't climb it. What do they do? They get to this point and they actually fly up to this 90 degree elbow, which is also three inches, which interacts with a 45 degree elbow, which tips it down so we don't get rain, snow, and other things washing down your pipe. Also, we want to face that to the south or southeast, right? Here's another thing. We have to support this pipe. So we have a steel pipe that's driven in the ground below the frost line. That's a carbon steel pipe. It could be galvanized or something like that. We have to attach it to our vertical riser pipe at at least two points, in my opinion. So we need pipe brackets there. This pipe can be one inch diameter. You also notice that these are schedule 40 and uh, it doesn't have to be, it can be thinner. There's some drain, there's lots of options here. So there's drain pipe, but anyway, I priced it all together. So all these fittings, the pipe, the brackets, the pipe that goes into the ground, the vertical lineup, the elbows, all schedule 40 here and the 45, what do you think that costs you? As of today, all these parts I found online at Home Depot, $67.52. And of course, you're doing it yourself, so there's no labor there. If you're bringing a handyman, you're going to spend a pile of money. So the box, the bottom box, would be static. The support system would be static. Your bees could fly up. When they're coming back in, they go straight down, and they get back inside the hive. So technically, it's doable. Disclaimer, if you do this on your beehive and it does not work, I accept no responsibility. This is a concept sketch. It has not been tested on a practical level. But just thoughts that I had, this is what I think would actually work out for JJ. Let me know what you think. How good is that? Let me see. Can you actually get a good screenshot of that right there? And then we'll back up the picture again here. Okay. So what do you think about that idea? I think it would be fun to do. And also, I hope that if JJ does it, we get feedback and that you send photos. I want to see them. How would you send photos? A lot of people want to know that. How do I send you photos of what's going on? Well, you join that fellowship, the Facebook group, and then you can post photos, videos, everything else, as long as it's relevant to topics and you're not spamming or promoting something that you're selling. See what I'm saying? Okay, so question number one right out of the gate. That was very interesting. It took me a long time considering the very brief presentation that I gave right now, but yeah, it's doable. Three inches, four inches, it makes perfect sense because people talked about putting fabric down those lines and things like that so that uh, the bees could climb up. But climbing up takes a long time, so it makes much better sense that these wide open, and some of these display systems that had these, they were like uh, almost plexiglass, big conduit pieces that they traveled through. So I think those are great because a lot of things could benefit the bees there. One is that wasm stuff aren't going to be traveling down that ridiculous long entrance to get there. The other thing is bees are going to line up and vent the air out. So the air movement in and out, this isn't like people, you know, like when you're a kid and you get the garden hose and you jump into a pond or a swimming pool and you think you're going to breathe through that garden hose and you realize that your lungs have to press against the weight of the water and that you're just rebreathing the air that you're putting. Okay, that's a whole nother story. And I certainly wouldn't know anybody that would have tried that as a kid. Moving on, question number two, Kathy Hathaway. Thanks again for another great video. I have a question. In one of my hives, I know I have a queen in this hive. There are eggs, larvae, capped brood, everything, but the last three inspections, we cannot find her. She was marked when I got her. I know that they can clean it off of her. We were talking about the mark on the thorax there. I have pulled every frame at least two times to try to find her. I've looked in the box with frames out. Was just wanting to see her. Any ideas on how to spot the queen? Okay, so I'm going to dodge this one because I know that finding your queen can be difficult, but guess what? There's a book by Hilary Kearney. It's called Queen Spotting. 
And in that book, titled Queen Spotting, it's available on Amazon, I'm sure it's available a lot of other places, but Hillary Kearney did a whole bunch of these fold-out pictures of the queen, and it shows the behavior of the retinue around the queen, and also it's full of ideas on how to spot your queen. So that's the first plug I want to do. Get nothing for saying that about Hillary's book. So it's a cool book, great photography. Moving on from that, uh, what I do when I'm going through the beehive and I'm looking for the queen, and this year I've done a great job of finding queens because I've been marking them all. So this is the first year that I tried to mark 100% of my queens, and I got really good at it because of that. Because in the past, as said here, you know, do you really have to find your queen to know that she's in there? If you find eggs, your queen has been there within the last three days. She's there somewhere. She's just hiding. Darker queens are more difficult to find than the lighter queen. So if I had a bee weaver queen in there, she's kind of dark. Uh, they can blend in pretty good. So now you have to kind of squint your eyes and look at that frame. The frames that you find that have fresh eggs on them and some empty cells are the ones you're most likely to see your queen on. If you pull these beautiful frames of totally capped brood, why would the queen be there? She doesn't care. She's not going to be on that one. The nurse bees will be there waiting for that brood to hatch out so that they can uh, start feeding them and taking care of their cells and everything else. And then the queen will be back. So if you have freshly hatched brood and that's where the new eggs are coming in, find your queen there. But we're looking at cells where you're seeing open larvae of all ages and around the fringes. Now you'll start to see the eggs. Now start looking for that queen. So as the queen walks across the frame, sometimes she leaves an open space behind her. The other thing is if you squint your eyes and you see bees kind of facing one of the bees as she's moving along, then you get a better chance of seeing the queen. The other thing is you look for that shiny thorax. So right behind her head, she's got a large thorax. It's always hairless unless it's a brand new queen and uh, very shiny and conspicuous. So again, when you squint your eyes, you will see that black dot moving through there on the thorax a little bit better. The most common thing that people pick out as the queen, and they do this on my videos all the time, I saw the queen at such and such, I saw the queen at so and so, 99% of the time it's a drone. Drones are big, drones are bulky, drones look like queens, but their eyes are too big, queen's heads are a little small, the thorax is big, the abdomen is long, and the wings only go halfway down the abdomen. So once you spot them, you'll start seeing them easier, quicker, right away. Pretty soon you'll wonder how you ever missed them. So it's a matter of practice. The other thing is older people sometimes have problems seeing them. I'm not saying that you're older, but if you have grandchildren, like I have grandsons, three of them right now, granddaughter on the way, by the way. Anyway, if you have grandsons and you've taught them to look for the queen and you show them what the queen looks like, then um, they're good at spotting them. So grandfather, isn't that the queen? And that's right. I make them call me grandfather. Is that the queen right there? No, I can't. Oh, wait. Yeah, it is. And then I pick her up and we put her in our one-handed queen catcher and we mark that queen. But uh, Hillary Kearney's book, Queen Spotting, the book is dedicated to that. And, of course, practice. Now, the other thing is I always remove frames as I go in the very beginning. That way, the queen that's in the colony can't jump from frame to frame. Because as we're moving frames around, sometimes it's get around the inside surface, get on the next frame. We've already looked at it, we're moving along, and then we miss her. So if you create a gap of at least two frames in there, start at one side, move it over, pull it out. By the way, as a new beekeeper in your backyard operation, I would really like it if you did not... Hold your hand. I like to do this when I'm teaching people and walking people through a hive inspection. Where do you think the queen is? Well, where the brood's concentrated. Looking at the top of all these frames, how would we know where the brood is concentrated? Hold your hand out over here. Use the back of your hand. Why the back of your hand? The back of your hand is more sensitive to hot and cold. So you put the back of your hand over the top here. Now you pan across the top. Ooh, does it really warm up right there? 94 to 97 degrees Fahrenheit where the brood is. So where the brood is, the queen is. But, And then, of course, as we go into the inspection, then I'm either full of nonsense or, hey, you're onto something. There's the queen where the brood is. And it was warm, just like you said. So it's perfect when all that comes together. But don't be tempted to go right there and pull that frame straight up. And that's because your queen, what you don't see about the surface of the frames, the surface of the honeycomb in there, is that it may not be perfectly straight. It may have these little matching contours in between. 
And what's beast at base? 3 eighths of an inch. And if the queen happens to be on that and you pull that thing straight up, you can roll and injure your queen. That's why I always say, pull the frames to the side, pull the frames out, look at them carefully, and then you get a couple frames out on your frame holder on the end, which by the way, that little mule frame holder is being sold by Better Be. That's my favorite frame holder because it can't fall out of it. The company we thought went out of business, but then I saw their components for sale at Better Be. So for a really good frame holder, that's the one I like. I put two frames in it. Then I just go through and pull each frame out one by one, put it against the side, pull the next frame. And that way your queen keeps moving over if it's a skittish queen. Some queens don't care. They're right out there in the open. They're laying eggs. They don't care what you're doing. You can pull it up. You can take pictures. You can make a video. They're in the cells laying eggs, moving on their happy way. But others are fast moving. They move around the sides. We were just doing an inspection in Harbor Creek, Pennsylvania. And uh, looking for the queen. I pulled her up. Where did she go? Right through the corner. Right through an opening onto the back side of the frame after I had looked at the back side of the frame. So if we weren't actively paying attention as we spin the frame around and look at the other side... There she goes right through trying to hide, but instead she got caught and marked. So it's a matter of the, being aware of both sides, manipulating your frames, moving them and keeping a space between those and the next frames that you're going to and focusing on the frames that you see a lot of eggs on. That's the best I can do for you. And then, uh, of course, include young children with very good eyesight. Show them what it looks like and you'll be amazed at what they notice. And they help us out a lot in the bee yard that way. They spot stuff right and left all the time. Question number three, moving on. This comes from Joe. Uh, this will be my first winter as a beekeeper, and I'm located in North Idaho near Sandpoint, and cold weather is about 30 days away. Isn't that sad? 30 days from really cold weather. I have three of the better bee polystyrene beehives. My hives all have good stores of honey. I'd like to know what steps I need to take to winterize this type of hive. Do I need to close up or greatly reduce the entrances? Well, the thing is, standard entrances in wintertime, my entrances for winter hives, other than the hive gate units that we're testing this year, my entrances are generally only three inches wide in wintertime and three eighths of an inch high. Three eighths of an inch is easy to remember because that's also a bee space. But guess what? Based on observation with all my surveillance cameras that are out there, I watch mice. And here we have the deer mice, we have meadow mice, and there are house mice, and it's weird. The house mice show up outside, the deer mice try to get into your house, so it's kind of backwards. But what can't they get through? They can't get into that 3 8 inch space, even if it's wide and flat. They don't squish down and get in there. We're not talking about baby mice, we're talking about the adult mice that are seeking shelter for winter time. And that 3 8 of an inch, they do not get into. What's another thing they don't get into? Those of you who are joining this experiment this year... I know some of you are sick of hearing about them. The hive gates. See that tiny opening? No mouse is getting in there. So that requires no mouse guard. It is a mouse guard on its own. So anyway, I've seen mice try to get into my hives. And I've seen them chew the front too. So if they had a long time unobserved to chew the front, they might ultimately chew it open and get in there. But I've not had a single mouse get into a 3 8 inch high opening in the last five years. So, and deer mice run straight up the front of a beehive. They can jump like a grasshopper from the ground onto the side of the hive. They run across the front. They're checking everything out, and they can't get in. So I stand by that one. I have not had a mouse in a beehive that was active and full of bees for more than five years. The only place that deer mice and the other mice, meadow mice and things like that, have shown up is in stored equipment that they have access to. They build their little nest in there. You're doing inspections in the spring. You're starting to get your gear out and get ready for splits and swarms and stuff like that. And there's the mouse inside an empty box. So that works. So your entrance, that's perfectly fine. Three eighths of an inch, three inches wide. And that's enough for even a full size colony. Tip your landing boards. This is winter preps now. Tip your landing boards down towards the landing board. Face your hive entrances. Hopefully they're already this way. East by southeast or south by southeast. And uh, that is the optimum landing board because in the, in the wintertime when the sun is low in the sky and it warms one side of your beehives while the other, the back side, the north side stays cold and in the shade all the time, 
it melts off all the snow and ice from your entrance. So it's another bonus there by having it oriented in that direction. And in my apiary, I have hives facing all different directions so I can make those comparisons. The other thing is that hopefully your stuff is in the sun. Let's see, should I leave at least one of the hive top vents open? The science supports no top venting. What it does support is top insulation. So no air travel because they create a warm air bubble up there that they preserve and we want that insulated so there's no condensation. We're talking about these insulated. It says here that they're better bee polystyrene beehives. I know that better bee has bee max, which if I were looking at better bee and I were looking at the polystyrene hives in there, those insulated hives, bee max would be my choice. I don't have any of those insulated hives, but if I were getting one, it would be a B-Max just because I like the way they're built and they're thick and they're super insulated. More insulation, less food gets consumed. So anyway, um, so the top vents, we would close them and there are scientific studies supporting that, which shows exactly what the CO2 levels are that the bees build up in that upper area, what the humidity levels are and whether or not it's worth the trade-off to have a small vent up there to where that warm, moist air goes out through the top, which it naturally would. It would rise, go out, because that's the opening. Cold air would replace it coming in the entrance, and then that loop is maintained, and it's up to the bees to block that activity. It's been demonstrated that this buildup of CO2 up there benefits the bees. It's also been demonstrated that the moisture that occurs inside the hive against the sidewalls, not the interior, not the interior surface directly above your cluster, but the sidewalls. That's why if we have insulation, at a minimum you insulate the top. The insulation on the top should be higher than the insulation on the walls because if condensation occurs, we want it on the walls. Bees need the moisture. So guess what was negatively impacted by this high humidity and by this low oxygen level that was up there where the bees were clustering in winter? Varroa destructor mites couldn't handle it. So they could not move up with the bees and take, and take that on. So it also has passive um, Varroa destructor mite control there to some level. So I don't have any top vents anymore. Last winter, I went through a winter, no top vents, all top insulated, and people were losing their bees right and left around here. I was very happy because I was paranoid. Some of our most expensive, most experienced beekeepers with huge numbers of hives took heavy losses last winter, and it was kind of unexplained. So I was paranoid thinking that I'm gonna open up all my hives in spring and find that I have a whole bunch of dead outs or maybe I've lost almost all of my hives, I don't know. Some people did. Some people were out of the bees business in one winter. So, but what I did last year was no top vents and I've done that before. I've done the venting, non-venting, insulated, uninsulated. I've done all that through the years because I've been keeping bees since 2006 and seven. So the winter of 2006 going into 2007. That's when I started my bee um, keeping and evaluations and stuff. So now we've arrived at the Thomas Seeley, the Dr. Tom Seeley approach, which is keep your colonies small and have no top venting and insulate them and have only a deep and a medium box in my part of the country. If you're in a colder area, maybe they need more honey to get through winter. The more insulated, the less honey they need. The more venting you do, because that can be done, it just challenges the bees and now they have to work harder to stay warm and keep their cluster warm because all the heat that they're creating up there is venting off through the top. And whatever way that you do that, the bees are going to need more food resources because it's just like if you had the front door open in your house. Let's say we have a three-story house and we open our front door in the wintertime. Somebody shows up. They're bringing Christmas gifts or whatever they do. They open it up and a little gust of cold air comes in and everybody goes, ooh, shut the door. But then you open up a tiny window upstairs in somebody's room and you leave that window partially open. The minute you open that front door, you have a draft that goes through the house, up the staircase, through that room and out that top window and that vents very fast and it moves cold air up and through that area right away. That's what we're talking about when you have a beehive that has that top inner capsule that is compromised by a top vent. Air constantly moves up through that top vent coming in through the bottom and running cold air which causes condensation up there. 
there's going to be a dew point somewhere in that top vent area where you're going to have icing up and you're going to have moisture condensation high in the hive that otherwise might not be there. So if you had a sealed top of your hive the way it would be in a tree. So if you had a single entrance, no venting up at the top, where the cluster is, they're going to keep that air directly above that cluster, nice and dry. Condensation on the sides where the dew point happens. And we've seen this in the observation hives too. The dew all collects below that mantle that's established by the winter cluster of bees. I know I'm spending a lot of time on this, but I want to get my point across about it, that I didn't just arrive at it, you know, through a whim, that it's through lots of practice that we came up with that, and it is, it's been supported. I have the Better Bee Polystyrene Feeder. I can put either sugar syrup in it or fondant. Okay, so when winter comes, when the temperatures block, drop below 50 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, no more liquid uh, syrup in there at all. So fondant or dry sugar, in my opinion, they're equal. I know that one is inverted sugar. That's great. The bees will use what they need. It's an emergency feed. Remind you that... Uh, Keeping enough honey in for your bees to go through winter is the goal. And then anything you put up in that hive top feeder, for me, those are the rapid rounds. Um, then we want to put dry sugar or fondant, which is dry because it's just a block of sugar that's been, it's been cooked. So do I need to do that? Large boxes look very full and very well stocked with honeycomb. So like for me last year... Um, there wasn't a single colony that used their emergency resource on top of the hive. One of them partially used it, so they, they ate little tunnels in it and they ate little bits on it. And of course the sugar condensation got on it up in there and uh, solidified it. So we had chunks of sugar bricks. And then what it did is took that out, mixed it with water and fed it back to them as syrup. So it wasn't even wasted in the spring if they needed it. So that better be feeder. Again, it's only for, and by the way, that polystyrene feeder, I don't actually like it. It comes from Better Bee because it takes up the whole top. It's the whole thing. And then at one end, they come up over the top, there's a clear thing, and then it goes into this big open basin, which is okay, but it's an integral part of your hive. So if you need to look down underneath, you got to pull that whole feeder off. So if that's full of feed, you're lifting that and everything. Plus, if it's used in other parts of the year for sugar syrup, you're lifting off sugar syrup and moving it just to do your hive inspections. So I'm not a fan of the whole takes the place of a top box style of feeder for that reason. So anyway, uh, what about additional insulation? If you've got a BMAX uh, hive, you've got all the insulation that you need. Uh, should the hives be further insulated? I say no, that's more than enough. Is there something I missed? Nope. The entrance sounds good. You're going to be keeping mice out. That's good. Also, one of the things that, and we're going to talk about this through the winter, obviously coming up, but uh, we're going to talk about making sure dead bees are out of your bottom board, pulled out and uh, make sure that uh, you've got some kind of tool that can rake out dead bees from an entrance because there's nothing sadder than to get into spring and find a colony of bees that you thought were so strong and you find that they're dead because they're all piled up at the entrance and the bees could not get out when it came time for cleansing flights. This is an argument that some people make for having an upper entrance or an entrance that's off the floor as it's designed for this really long exit pipe here that we talked about. The entrance was an inch off the floor and that's to accommodate a collection of dead bees. But you're going to want to, and that's also why I don't like the mouse guards. I'd rather have a smaller entrance reducer instead of a mouse guard. Because if the mouse guards are screwed into place with hardware cloth or whatever somebody chooses to use, a lot of people use quarter inch um, hardware cloth or half inch hardware cloth, then they don't pull it off and then there's dead bees piling up behind it and they have no way to rake it out. So if it's not convenient, some beekeepers won't clear out the dead bees. They just think when cleansing flight times happen, the bees will clear that out themselves. So upper entrances can give them an exit in a time when there might be a bunch of dead bees down below. But what I say to that is, don't be lazy. Go out there and clean the dead bees out of your hive entrance. So that upper entrance, again, not necessary. So that's it for Joe. That's my advice. You got that polystyrene hive, that thing is super insulated. Next question, number four, comes from Carl, Danville, California. Wondered why you've not been filming this year in front of your observation hive. Well, 
I wish I were filming in front of the observation hive, but guess what? My bee building is being renovated and I'm going to replace the entire building. And the observation hives, plural, are going to be in the new building. And what's the new building going to be used for? It's going to be three times the size of my existing building. And that's going to be my way to be academy where I'm going to teach people about beekeeping right here. So this year we're renovating. We're getting rid of the old stuff. It turns out I accumulated a lot of stuff in that building and getting rid of a building is not always easy to do. So I'm going to swap it out completely and I have contractors coming in October to put down the slab for my way to be academy. So just, uh, off the cuff, what would you consider to be, if you're trying to learn about beekeeping and you want it to be in a small group and you want it to be in a building dedicated to learning about bees and then just beyond that building, you've got all these different hive configurations at your disposal to learn about so you can pick the kind that you would like to work with. What would be the optimum size class? How many students should there be? 10, five, 20, one instructor. It's just gonna be me. Might bring in guest speakers, that kind of thing. But the way to be Academy is going to be a single, like a one room schoolhouse. And around that is a bunch of stations with bees, observation hives that you can look at year round and see what the bees are doing. So what size class would you think would be optimum for something like that? But that's why I don't have the observation hive because the observation hive is empty and I don't like it by the way, I'm changing the style. Coming up with my own observation hive design. That's gonna be in that building three of them minimum, maybe more. Next is question number five, which comes from Beth Kellogg from Vermilion, Ohio. First year beekeeper in Northeast Ohio, can you explain to me what I should do for winter at the hive entrance? Do I leave it wide open with a mouse guard or put a reducer on them with a mouse guard? And what size reducer? My colony will be too deep for winter. I'm assuming mouse guard should be going on very soon as the night temps are in the 50s. Congrats. And uh, so here's the thing, those of you who are using the hive guards, now we have not gone through a winter on these. So I'm not blanket endorsing this entrance. So we are gonna find out this year, I've got this on more than half of my hives. We're gonna see how it goes through winter and this would not require a mouse guard. Uh, what it does require is that you clean out dead bees from it. Now I happen to have a boroscope for that. So I'm going to feed it right through here and I'm going to see what's going on in the winter time. I'm going to look up and see where the cluster is. These things have a hole in the middle here so that it can pivot. So you can move this entrance inside so it stays underneath the cluster of bees, but mine will not have the screw in it. Because that little post right there, I've got a hook that's going to go in here and hook onto that. And I'm going to pull this whole thing out and then I'm going to dump any dead bees out of it. Then I'm going to slide it right back in there so mine will not have that screw in there so that you can do this pivot. So we're looking forward to seeing how that goes through the winter, but I already answered uh, Beth's question. I did want to mention the other thing, and it's also called Hive Gate, and it's made by BIQ Solutions. If you want to look into that, it's made in New Zealand. So we're still going to be looking at that, but guess what? yellow jackets and everything else are on the rise and they're starting to attack the beehives guess what they're not getting into all the hives even little tiny colonies even my swarm storm storm swarm the storm swarm that i caught isn't getting robbed by anybody because they have those new reduced entrances on them so this is fun times and the feedback from everybody that's joined that citizen science group for the hive gate is uh the feedback's really positive so happy about that Glad we can help an inventor with something like that. Here's question number six. Got my nuke here in Austin, Texas on June, four frames. Since then the hive is still not fully drawn the other four frames. I started with four fully drawn frames, one undrawn foundation sheet frame that came with a nucleus and three empty frames. After almost one month of hive basically not showing much activity, drawing out frames, and I was feeding them, I replaced the empty frames with foundation sheet frames. So we went from foundationless to a foundation sheet frame. So now we have something for them to build off of. I inspect every other week. That's actually a pretty good inspection cycle. 14 to 21 days is pretty good. I have seen queen eggs, larvae, capped brood, all look healthy, but very little progress drawing out or comb in these frames. 
While I have seen my queen in all of my last three inspections before yesterday, there was also a single super seizure queen cell. Top third, middle of the frame. Not closed, but full with royal jelly. I took it off every time since I have a queen. This inspection yesterday, I left the queen cell while well, there is an active queen. I was hoping you would have a thought on why bees are not drawing the extra frames, why they seem to want a new queen, blaming her for not laying more when they are not giving her more frames to lay in. Would you take the queen cell off again or would you leave it? I understand that it probably is impossible to give exact advice. Okay, here's what. Whenever I see them building a queen cell, near the top, near the bottom, around the fringe. If it's a good size, big cell, not only that, they've done it more than once, even though there's extra space in the colony and what else is not happening? They're not filling the extra frames with comb, even though you've put in what I'm going to guess is heavy waxed acorn foundation. That's the number one material that they will build off of. Uh, if you had foundationless, that's more resources for them to do. But of course, the heavy wax foundation, the more wax on the foundation, the quicker they'll build it. But they haven't done it in all this time. Plus, the bees are telling you, the beekeeper, they want a different queen. So, I would let them uh, raise their new queens. In fact, since you find the queen each and every time, you find that she's easily accessible. I would let them build, hopefully, multiple queen cells. And then, because... We're at a time of year when this is really hard on them, but you're about to go into winter with a queen that's really not robust for whatever reason. And they want to replace her. And we're heading for cold. But you're in Texas. So you have more time than we do up here. So all I can say is what I would do here. If I had multiple cells in there and the cells get capped. So by the time the cells get capped, which happens on their ninth day, right? So we know that within the week, that new queen is going to be out of one of those cells beyond the capping date. That's when I would remove my queen. Take her out. Get rid of her. Let her go. And then uh, they're going to hatch out, and then one of them is going to prevail, or they're going to be favored by the retinue of nurse bees that are in there looking towards their new queen, which they have a lot of ways of showing their favor for the new replacement queen. We still have drones flying here, so I'm just going to guess you have drones flying there. And so there would be a very good chance that she flies out and gets mated 9 to 14 days after she hatches. And then where are you at? You're into October in Texas, so I don't know what the resources are there. But now you would have a brand new mated queen coming back, and then she would start to produce brood, and you would suffer a loss of bee numbers going through that period. That's also why... I suggest keeping your existing queen in there for as long as possible. What you don't want to happen is you don't want that existing queen to actually swarm. Because if she swarms, you're going to lose a bunch of very valuable worker bees in that colony, which you now need considering the size of it. So the nucleus sounds like it was weak to begin with, that the queen was probably weak to begin with. Because they respond to the queen's pheromone when she's there. They respond to the pheromone released by the brood that are hatching out. So it's a synergistic effect that they have, which keeps them producing. And as they get those stimulants from the pheromones, the queen mandibular pheromone, and then we've got the pheromone that's coming off the larvae that are hatching, uh, that is supposed to stimulate them to bring in more protein, to make more cells and space for more resources to be stored. They're not doing those things. So the numbers must be smaller or her pheromone must be low enough that they're not inspired enough to progress and produce more infrastructure in the hive. Therefore, we need to get a new laying queen in there as soon as possible. So if you have, you now it's, it's so late in the year for all of this kind of manipulation, but you want to keep them healthy and going, and you didn't mention mites or things like that, so we don't know if anything else might be holding them back. But I would let them make their new queens, and I would keep that existing queen in there as long as possible. And if you really want to push her to the last limit, I would put a hive entrance queen excluder on there. 
So if you wanted to keep your queen from leaving, they're building new cells. And uh, if you can time that, so if you know exactly when they build the cells, you would put this thing right on the front of your hive. This is a queen excluder in a wooden frame that sits right on the landing board that goes right up against the hive entrance. All your workers can come and go. Your drones cannot come and go through this. But we know that the queen could not swarm and get away. So then that would cue you on when you want to get a hold of that queen and pull her out and would allow you to keep her closer to the zero date because they can start to swarm any time after those queen cells are capped they can they can swarm at any time so you got to get your queen out of there ahead of time or provide some kind of barrier to keep the queen from going but then you have to find her in that mess of bees that's trying to swarm and get her out of there again so this is a a neutral answer. I wish I could give a better one, but uh, that's what I'm thinking. Replace the queen. And another thing would be if you can get all the queen breeder there. You're in Texas. I don't know where this part of Texas is. Austin. I don't know how far that is from where the Bee Weaver family lives, but I would maybe consider pulling the queen and getting rid of those uh, queen cells that you have and put a laying queen in there right away that you have zero interruption in brood because you would pull the existing queen two days to three days before you install the new one, install a laying queen. I would recommend a bee weaver queen. You're right there. She would have very little time in transit and look at the temps. Totally doable without damaging your queen in transit. So there's another option. Let them make their own, get the queen out of there or buy an laying queen and have no interruption. This one comes from Derek, and uh, what does it say? Well, apparently, I'm as dumb as everyone else. They weren't closed. I did fun. One has an additional issue. Okay, when we're talking about things that are closed, this brings me up to flow of frames. Here's what I want to talk about. This is for the flow hive keepers out there, because this is happening to a lot of people, and I'm kind of surprised, but there again, if you're brand new to a flow hive, you might have bought one, you might have put it all together, take these frames out, you put them in the flow super, you put that flow super on when your bees have been productive, they've done everything else, and I'm getting this a lot from people. My bees are all over those flow frames. They are producing zero honey in them. So I want you to look at something here. And if you see, look at the frame set up here, look at the cell configuration. These are in the open position. No amount of bee work is going to close that up and allow them to put nectar in those cells and create a honey flow for you. So what you have to do is take the key that came with it and I'm gonna show you this up close. So let me get my camera zoomed in here. Do -do -do -do. And I want you to see what they should look like. These are the cells in the open position. You need to put this key in the top and you need to cycle them closed like that. And this is true of brand new cells as well. When you put them in, when you put this in the bottom here and they're in the open position, that is something that your bees will never fill. They will not work the frame. So you got to put it in the top, all the way to the back. Close your cells, just like that. If you do not see that all of your cells in your flow frames are closed, you will be very disappointed that your bees are not. <laughs> that, my face is too close. But you'll be very disappointed that your bees are not going to store honey in that cell because it's in the open position. And the reason we're saying that, and, you know, kudos to Derek. Most people will not admit when they make a mistake. That's part of the problem with beekeeping. We have to admit the mistakes that we've made so that we can learn from them. And then we share with each other about the mistakes we've made. We put our egos aside and talk about what works and what doesn't. These people that lost all their bees last winter, you got to park your ego and admit you lost them instead of like sneaking in a bunch of packages and things. Oh yeah, my bees all made it. Uh, it benefits one another when we share what the failures were. And that's an embarrassing one because it's in the instructions that come with flow frames. But here's the thing, when they come out of the box, you just think, oh, 
there's a cap that goes in the end and that cap wouldn't go in the end unless that uh, was in the closed position but you know what the very first leaf can be pushed down on its own and that cap goes in there and it you could think that they're all in position to be filled by the bees so this is a very common problem with people that have flow supers they're just assuming the flow frames are good to go because when you take them out of the cardboard box each one is packaged in its own cardboard box and it's already got the cap in it everything is together so we don't pull the cap out and look to see if all the frames are set we just load it all in we get excited we adjust the screws and push it up against the front there and they're all supposedly good to go but we're failing to inspect to see that all those cells are not in this position but instead they're in this position there's another um, style of frame that's out there better comb this is another problem that people are having with better comb I get some angry people. I don't know why you're angry at me. They work for me. So if you're angry and they're not working for you, here's what uh, I've mentioned to those people too. Do you know that when you're, uh, when the bees make honeycomb, when they form the cells, they are not level. The cells are tipped like this. And when they put nectar in there, that holds it in. So it's at an angle. What if it was tipped like this? The bees can't put nectar in there. It's just going to run right back out. Therefore, what do they do? They don't use it. So a lot of people, and this is, this is so frustrating because this information is in the instruction manual that comes with the better comb. People just pull out the better comb. They look at it. They put it in the frames. They wire reinforce it, whatever they've done, and they put it in the hive. And they never once look to see if the cells are angled down or if the cells are angled up. And then you get people that say, bees don't use them. It's garbage and then some people won't show you the frame so it's it's really obvious that this is the top of the frame and that when you angle this to look into it it's either incorrectly or it's not because you could frankly you could install it either way upside down right side up there is a right side up for the frames there's a right side up for the comb and if you put it in upside down they're never going to use it so it's really interesting and I can imagine it's frustrating for um, the inventors. But here's the thing. I'm really glad that Derek mentioned that because he's the third person this year that has had bees not working the Flow Super that contacted me about that. And I just said, is there any chance that those are in the open position? And he wrote back and said that they were. So thank you very much for admitting that. And now we'll see if we're not too late and we can get some honey in there for you. So question number eight. This is from Rachel. So I thought I'd done another successful forced abscond. I cut out from a bee tree a few weeks ago as they all stayed in the box overnight. Just a few scattered foragers back in the tree the next afternoon, but alas, two emergency queen cells were made from the one piece of brood frame I took with them. I learned something from each one of these, so hopefully I'll get more consistent. Two queens should have hatched Wednesday the 1st, so today's the 10th, so that's nine days ago. Sort out who is the fairest of them all and hoping she get out and made it yesterday or today before it rains again tomorrow. Question, how long before I go to check again? So with that scenario, with that timeline, remember that after a queen hatches, she's not ready to mate right away. So we have to add about nine days on average. And it can go to 14, 15, 16 days beyond that. So I would inspect again on the 14th. So give your queens that are freshly hatched time to get settled, matured, capable of flying, and then going out to that drone congregation area to have the time of her life, and then come back and then inspect on the 14th, and you should be able to see um, eggs in there. So beyond the, beyond the hatching of the queen, they can go depending on weather conditions. Sometimes they get held back and held in due to weather. So a couple of weeks would be a good safety net to check and make sure that everything is okay. Because the other thing is we want them to be queen right. Also said here early in the season here, oh that's right, this is, this is Australia, Western Australia. Early in the season here, my own hives had only one or two drones in them there were quite a few in the tree and swarms are happening in farm areas nearby as the canola is in full bloom. So if you've got one or two drones in a colony that's really 
not booming yet, then I would assume that the drone congregation areas will be fully loaded with plenty of drones to do that mating. So hopefully that helps Rachel. We're not too late. Check again on the 14th and then don't forget to update us and let us know how they worked out. There are multiple cells, so we got some choices of queens there. That's good news. Here's question number nine from Keith. Gold Coast, Queensland, Australia. So a lot of people from Australia chiming in and they're just getting another B year. I wish we were not going into the colder temps and shorter days here, which reduces the amount of foraging time our bees have. But anyway, question about laying workers. Once a hive has laying workers, can or will they raise a new queen from an introduced brood frame containing eggs and young larvae? Have a nucleus hive that failed to requeen almost exactly at three weeks, I have laying workers. It takes three weeks for laying workers in the absence of a queen's pheromone to activate and start laying eggs. They activate their own ovaries. Laying workers can do that and it takes a while to do it. And then once they start laying, that's when we get in a big pickle here. And that's why we have to do these inspections in two to three weeks to make sure that things are good. So we know what's going on. I actually spotted several workers laying in cells confirming my suspicions. I can share a couple of photos if you're interested. Uh, so you see multiple eggs in the cells. Sometimes you'll see the eggs partially down the cell. And now we've got laying workers. Now we have a huge pain to overcome. So here's what I'm going to suggest. And there's a lot of people doing experiments about this, but I've been doing my own experiments with QMP, which is queen mandibular pheromone, but specifically it's synthetic. So you can actually buy synthetic queen mandibular pheromone, and you can put that in there to suppress laying workers by having a pheromone present that fakes them out and makes them think that there's a fertile queen in there. And sometimes this can backfire if there is a queen in there that's unmated, for example. So they show favoritism uh, to wherever the strongest pheromone is concentrated. So again, as I mentioned earlier, there's a synergistic response from the bees. So there's, there's a double whammy that keeps your bees from activating their own ovaries. And some of these bees have more than others, but they can only lay drone eggs uh, because they've never been mated. They're not like a queen bee, but they all females have the potential to lay eggs. They're just haploid eggs. They're infertile. So they only get drones. So here's the thing. Um, when there are larvae that have hatched, they release a pheromone into the air. When there's a queen that's in lay, she releases her pheromone, the QMP. And then that combination of those pheromones completely suppresses any laying workers. So here's the thing. Once you have laying workers, would introducing eggs cause those laying workers to stop laying and instead attend to those eggs which when they hatch would release a pheromone that lets them know what cast they are. So it lets them know, is it a drone? Is it a worker bee? Is it a queen? Well, it's not a queen because they're in worker cells, but they have the potential to make a queen from that egg when it hatches on its third day. So, but will they? They're already in lay. So what they're doing is they're pretending to be queens. They're walking around there, all these workers are like, I'm laying eggs, I'm laying eggs over here. They're laying eggs, we're laying eggs, we don't need a queen. So, could you overwhelm them with this combination? See what I'm saying? What do you think I'm going to say? Get that frame of eggs and the recently hatched larvae that are on it. Yes, put it in there. What else should you put in there at the exact same time? Synthetic queen mandibular pheromone. And here in the United States, we get this from Better Bee. There may be other sources for it. I don't know what's going on in Australia, what the availability is, but it's got to be somewhere over there. Get your queen mandibular pheromone, synthetic pheromone in first. You keep it in the freezer. I have a bunch of it. So much fun to mess with it. I've got swarms to fly out of the air onto my hand holding it, and it's just a lot of fun. Anyway, so it's this double whammy. We have to we have to take over the pheromone warriors in here. They're, they're fake queens. They're putting out their own pheromone. They're trying to make sure that people are attending to them because they don't, by the way, feed bees. When they become a laying worker, they turn off all of their feeding instincts and all that metabolic activity that causes them to feed recently hatched brood, right? So there are nurse bees doing that. So they're fakers. 
but their pheromone levels are low. The fewer, the fewer ovaries they have, they're not all the same. Some have several, some have just a few. The fewer they have, the better off we are. So it's a gamble, but let's try it. Let's see if it's gonna work. Do this for me and then give me feedback. Bring in the frame, put in your queen mandibular pheromone, put it at the top of the frame. And then you'll see a retinue of worker bees will go towards those little noodles that come and they will start to try to attend to that the way they would a queen. Plus, we have a double hit, that synergistic approach of having the secondary pheromone of recently hatched eggs. So now what are we doing? We're overwhelming and winning over the populace inside the hive. The nurse bees will attend to the fake queen, the newly hatched larvae, and then that'll give you a chance to get those laying workers to stop. Now here's the kick of it. Because we also have introduced a synthetic, I'm, I hope this is not overly complex for a lot of people that are listening, but we've introduced a synthetic queen for all practical purposes. So we've got, you know, just that pheromone in there, and now we've got the pheromone of the recently hatched eggs. Once it establishes, and once we can see that the eggs disappear, in other words, those laying workers have stopped laying, so you don't see any new eggs from them, you're gonna have to bring another frame in with eggs in it and remove the queen pheromone 24 hours before you do that. So the QMP, the synthetic QMP gets removed 24 hours later because we don't want those workers to reactivate. And then we put that new frame of eggs in there and then we're gonna see if they'll make queen cells for them. I'll bet it works. I'll bet it does. Because we have the advantage of being able to provide the QMP and the eggs, freshly hatched larvae, we need to win over those laying workers and get rid of them. So try it. Let me see if that works. I know I've given you basically one route to success on that. Laying workers, huge pain, huge pain. That's why we have to do our inspections 14 to 21 days on every hive uh, to make sure that, the, that they're queen right, that the eggs are there and that uh, we haven't lost the queen or she's been superseded and they never got a replacement and then all of a sudden you've got havoc in there because you've got laying workers. Once they start, it can be difficult. Question number 10. This comes from Daryl. I have a question about a problem I've been having with my hive butler. As I fill it, starting from the outer frame spaces, the inserted frames gradually cause the sides to push outward and the middle frames fall off the ledge holding them up and sink to the bottom becoming difficult to pull out. I've only loaded them with medium frames so far when harvesting honey, therefore, I don't know if it will happen with the deep frames thoughts. These are my thoughts. Uh, Daryl's not the first one to report that. So if you don't know, a hive butler is a plastic tote. It's a heavy duty tote and they're pricey. I have a pile of them and I've put deep frames in them, deep frames full of honey, seven pounds per frame. And they're not spreading out like that. So it's indexed. It's got slots designated so that the frames are set apart from one another and they're off the bottom and everything else. They handle deep frames, medium frames. You can transport bees in them. You can use them for a swarming location and all kinds of stuff. But another beekeeper uh, wrote to me and said that he had the same thing. So the frames were in there near the center of the tote. It flexed out. The frame went down. And I'm not sure if it just wouldn't support them or if it might have even cracked. So the first thing you have to do when this is happening with those high butler toads, you need to contact the company right away and let them know what's going on. There's some discussion that they might have had to use a different plastic material in production and that might not be as rigid as uh, like, for example, the ones that I have. They're very rigid and I tried to um, reenact the problem that's going on here by even pushing down on them, seeing how much flex was in it. And there wasn't. The, so the frames that I have in mind, they weren't going to sink, you know, no matter what they weighed. I could even take those frames with the lid off and I could set the next tote on top of the backs of those frames and nothing flexed out. So things that would add rigidity in the meantime, keep the lid on or put the hive totes, the hive butler totes right next to each other so they're bumped up against each other so they don't flex. But you know what? You shouldn't have to do that with those. They should be strong enough. They should be rigid enough. So if you've got hive butler totes that are flexing out and your frames are just falling in, I don't think that's acceptable. I think you should contact hive butler. 
uh, be prepared to show photos of what's going on and let them know that your Hive Butler tote is not rigid enough to support. If it's not supporting medium frames, it's not going to support deep frames. So, no, you're not alone. You definitely have no thoughts on how to fix it other than to avoid that by having the lids on or having them pressed against each other. But knowing how they're made, mine just, mine don't do it. So there may have been some substitution of material due to a lot of companies that make plastic um, equipment for beehives and other things. Even the hive, uh, the bee buses that shipped early this year through UPS from uh, through Man Lake. A lot of those bee buses were all taped up. Some of them broke open in transit. And then I find out later that even they had to use a different plastic material due to availability, due to COVID restrictions or whatever else is going on. Their supply is interrupted. Um, and sure enough, the bee buses that were shipped in the spring were way flexible. You know, the design, everything else was exactly the same. What was different was the material that they were made with. The old ones are nice and, nice and rigid. The new ones were very flexible, and that's why they taped them, uh, trying to keep them from falling apart. So I think there may actually be, in fact, we should probably hear something from them. Uh, there may actually have been a material substitution from the, the company that they work through that makes them for B Butler. Definitely let them know it's not doing its job, and I would expect that you would get a replacement or a credit or something like that that is not sat. Anyway, number 11, Amethyst 19. If bees are looking to swarm and an empty hive is set up in the yard, would it be possible to steer the swarm towards the empty hive, like filling a small container with bees, assuming at least some are scouts, and putting them in the new hive? Would they likely head home and tell others of the new location they can swarm to or putting an attractant like lemongrass oil in the empty hive. Okay, so a couple things are going on here. Yes, it's doable, first of all, because I've done it myself. I like doing it. It's a lot of fun affecting their election process on where they're going to go and where they're going to live. But um, the hive that you're trying to get them into, the more stuff that's in that hive that demonstrates that it's ever been occupied before by bees is going to be a bonus to you. So if you've got little bits of propolis and burr comb and things like that that you can sprinkle on the bottom of it, that's a help. If you've got frames that have previously used drawn out comb that smells like bees, that's a huge help. Don't put um, full frames of honey and things like that in there because that will encourage robbing. Now we have a conflict. Now we have a problem. But drawn honeycomb is great. Propolis bits and stuff, fantastic. As much as you can do to make that feel like it's previously occupied. Now on to the next thing. I just did this two days ago, by the way. Uh, I go up to the swarm. You know, they're clustered, they're bivouacked. That's what it's called when they're in their temporary location because bees don't fly out of the original colony with the queen and fly directly to their new home. It would seem like that would be the practical thing for them to do because the scouts have been out checking everything out for quite a while now. Sometimes more than a week in advance of the swarm happening, scouts are going out looking for places to live. But no matter what, they stop and collect at an intermediate location, and that's called bivouacking. So once they collect there, we can look at them, and we see what's going on. Scouts are going out. So if you've ever read Tom Seeley's book, The Honeybee Democracy, it explains this process in detail. That just one scout can't go out, find a spot, come back, do a waggle dance, tell everybody, I found this great place that we all need to go to, and then they all would leave. No, several of them have to come back with the exact same information. So here's what I do. I look at the surface of that clustered swarm. And I see the waggle dances going on. Well, the wagglers, those are scouts for sure. So you know what I do? Now I did this with my bare hands, but I highly recommend that you might want to wear gloves for this. Do not wear cowhide gloves. Wear goatskin gloves or something that does not smell like cowhide. Bees react most frequently in a negative way to cowhide than other materials. So let's do that. Or you can put on surgical gloves. Sometimes that works too, but you can be stung through them. So anyway, you scoop your hand through there. You get them just like a very careful ice cream scoop. They weigh quite a bit too. And you get the ones that are doing the waggling and you scoop them. And you walk over to the hive that you have that you want them to go into and you put it on the landing board. Just put your fingers out there. And you know what they'll do? They'll actually go into that hole and they'll start pacing off the inside. They'll start inspecting everything. 
and eventually they'll all leave your hand and then they go in there. Then you go over to, again, by the way, keep it in close proximity to the actual clustered swarm. And then you take another scoop of them, wherever you see the dancers, scoop that group because first of all, the ones doing the waggle dance are foragers. The ones that are paying attention to the waggle dance are also scouts and those are looking for a place to live. They're paying attention. So now we have a group of scouts. Those are the ones we want to influence. So you scoop that pile out and you put your hand on the landing board and they all go running into the hive. And they can spend quite a long time inside pacing it out and inspecting it and everything else. And pretty soon they fly out and then they go back. And then how do you know it's working? How do you know that the spot that you picked for them to go to is what they then start to communicate? Well, when those scouts go back and they land on the surface of that, you're going to see them doing what some people call a round dance. A round dance is really just a very short distance that they're communicating. But they'll, they'll get their angle and they'll just go, instead of a long waggle, which indicates a farther distance, so when they scoop to the right and waggle down, scoop to the left, waggle in the same direction. If they show just one direction and it's a round dance, they just walk through and they don't do a lot of waggling. And then you know where the position of the sun is and you know exactly where your location is and that's what they're communicating. You're about to win them over. And then the coolest part of it is when they all take to the air and go right into that uh, hive that you've set up. Now, I'm not saying that this is going to be 100% effective, but I can tell you that for me, it's been 100%. Every time I've done that, and with a lot of people standing around watching and videoing with their cell phones and stuff like that, you just scoop a handful of bees, you put them on the landing board, and you can do that many times because the more bees you get to go into there, the more committed they are. And then pretty soon they're flying back because you'll see them go between that and there. And then you see those waggles going on. And when they all start waggling on the surface, there's lots of dancers. Things are about to happen. They're about to move. And one of them, they actually flew high in the air, well away from the box we're trying to get them to go into, only to turn around in the space of like five minutes. So it was touch and go, it felt like, and then they all went into that box. Kind of a tiny miracle. You can do it. You don't need to do lemongrass oil and stuff like that or Swarm Commander once they're actively like this because you're influencing them. You're acting like a scout showing them where to go. People have a tendency to put too much Swarm Commander in there or put too much lemongrass oil in there. And then guess what that does? It repels the bees instead of attracts them. So just trace elements. But once you already have this control, you already know where the colony is and everything else. You just want them to go in there. That works. Or you could use BVAC, the Colorado BVAC, which I just tested, which happens to be my favorite method of getting bees out of inaccessible areas. Question number 12 here is John Jordan. Is this a sign of overcrowding? Seems like you could give them more room, maybe prevent swarm impulse. I have the same issue going on right now and I'm considering giving them more room because I'm scared they're gonna swarm. It's been in the upper 40s at night, raining, still have huge beards. Okay, so this is about a video that I had where I showed the bees bearding on the front. Bearding on the front of your hive is not a sign that your bees are preparing to swarm out. Those are the worker bees that are getting out of the way so that your workers inside the hive, the ventilators, those that are dehydrating down the honey, uh, they're out of the way so that they're not, because bees inside the hive contribute humidity inside the hive. They're in the way so they impede airflow through the hive. And so the, what they do is they move outside the hive and they beard. And yes, even with slatted racks, they do that and they dangle underneath, but I've got these hive visors on the front of my hives and most of them cluster up underneath of that. They have filled that space. So if a hive visor is this big, there's been a mass of bees this big right down the front and only an opening at that hive entrance and that's what they're venting through to dehydrate and try to control the humidity inside the hive, especially during storm periods high humidity and things like that. They are not making preparations for swarming. So if you've done your inspections every two to three weeks, then you would know that if they're making preparations for swarming, you see secondary signs for swarming, which would be things like super seizure cells, queen cells, which are swarm cells along the perimeter of your frames. If you don't see evidence of them making preparations for swarming, so a secondary indicator is that they would be building queen cells, but if they're just collecting on the outside of the hive, and so are the other 
uh, hives in your apiary. Right now, the honey is in the air. Everybody is fanning out. Everyone is venting. You go out there at night, it sounds like a bunch of clothes dryers on the sides of people's homes are running. They're moving so much air through there because that's their only way to dehydrate the nectar that they've stored inside the hive is to move air across it. And they're fanning. So that's what they're doing. And these workers are getting out of the way because they impede that progress. It takes twice the space. They take up twice the space for their nectar and everything as they ultimately will occupy when it's finished honey. So they also move it around a lot. So it can look like you're losing it or they're consuming it. But really what they're doing is taking it out and recondensing and getting it in areas where they're starting to cap it and things like that. So bearding on the front of your hive or bees all collected nice and tight on the front of your hive. They're inactive. They're passive looking. They are not making preparations to swarm. That looks very different. So I think John is okay. Number 13, Mad Devo. From Sydney, another Australian. So I noticed in your videos, you tilt your hive slightly forward so rain won't flow in the entrance. I also noticed that you use flow supers. And so I have to use a system to tilt them backwards when harvesting. I have a 10 frame Langstroth hive with a flow super on it and have it permanently tilted backwards so it's easy to harvest. I added your great weather shield above the entrance, which is the hive visor that we just talked about. Uh, stops rain issues very well, but uh, the tilt isn't so great for the bug tray in the bottom that I fill with oil because most of the oil accumulates towards the back. I was wondering, since your experience with slatted rags, I don't uh, see them much in Australia. What are your thoughts about having an angled slatted rag? The idea would be to have a base level or forward and then an angled slatted rack about an inch shorter at the back and then stack the hive. Everything would be tilted to the back. So actually what, what's being described here is the original flow hive or the basic flow hive system because now they're up to the flow hive 2 plus version. That's what, that's a flow hive too over there. Um, but their original bottom board was a screen bottom board and the bottom board stayed level and it was exactly as is described here. There was a, a shim built into it so that your hive was tilted back even though the bottom board was level. So that little wedge was in there. So yeah, you could do that. You can make your own. I'm, I wasn't a huge fan of that first bottom board because it's a screen bottom board with core flute sticking into it and it always got gummed up and you couldn't pull it out very much, but it did keep the hive itself in a tilted back position. And then, of course, the landing board area and the bottom board was level. So these trays that hold the fluids in them so you can trap mites and things like that, or in Australia, we're talking small hive beetles and things like that. So because uh, I guess they don't have the furrow destructor mites, lucky them. But yeah, you could do that. You can make it. The only thing is that sometimes there'll be a space. Mm -hmm. I'm gonna show you this. Underneath your slatted rack, this is what a slatted rack looks like. And so what we'd be talking about is this is the front with this heavy reinforced part here. So then this would be wedged. So you would cut it towards the back and then it would tilt like this maybe. You want the top to tilt back, but the bottom to stay level. So if you shaved it off and then the underside would have that tray, but I want to show you what can accumulate in the space underneath. Ta-da, look at that. So underneath the slatted rack, this colony of bees drew down comb right in the middle. And they even had a tiny, it looked like a queen cup there that they never fully developed. But I pulled this one out because I wanted to use it as an example of what can happen underneath. But yeah, you could use your slatted rack. You could cut a custom one and make a wedge so that your hive would be tilted back on top of it. And then of course the bottom board would stay level and then you'd shed rainwater and things like that. So it could work. You could have woodworking skills or make friends with woodworkers to do that kind of thing. So I hope that helps. And yeah, it does. The original, like I said, the original flow hive bottom board, screen bottom board, uh, was already pre-tilted just like that, just like they're described. And what I do for those of you who are wondering, what do I do to tilt the flow hives back then if they're on a standard Langstroth bottom? Because the new, the 
the Flow Hive 2 units all have the feet that are threaded so you can adjust the angles and everything else. But uh, the same thing, and those are built so that when they tilt back, the tray is level. So it's already factored in. But uh, so the thing is, you can tilt them back. The original was that way. You can also just put a jack. What I use is bottle jacks under the front of the standard Langstroth hives, and I tilt the whole hive up when it comes time to harvest. Then I release the jack, and it goes back down, and it settles. So, And the bees don't care. So you can just jack it up when you need to. Otherwise, leave it level. You wouldn't have to make those shims. It was very easy to do. I'm going to skip that one. There was a question about... Uh, all right, we'll go ahead and do it. This is from David, and it's question number 14. Wasp nest that you want to save. Does anyone make a one-way type of screen, check valve type thing, they can leave on the back uh, so the wasps will go out but not get back in. And this works on honeybees too, but I want you to look into trap out cones. So trap out cones are, and they're very easy to make yourself because it's just number eight hardware cloth and that's eighth inch openings. And you make a really long funnel out of it. And then you can have little um, ears on the ends and you can staple it to the front of a tree you can cover the wasp nest or whatever that you want. And it's important that it be a screen because we want the pheromones to come out of that opening and we want the returning wasps to try to get directly into it so they go to the sides of the screen. They don't always go out to the end of the cone and then find their way back in. That's why having that cone be 11 or 12 inches long is beneficial. This is also something that works when we have honeybees in an area that we don't want them to be in. So it's a trap out scenario. Some people run the cone right into a second box when it's bees, so that when they leave the cavity that they're in, if it's somebody's house, somebody's porch, something like that, they have to transit through the bee box that we ultimately want them to go into. And then the bees that are coming back, that are trying to get back to that original entrance, come in at the sides, they smell the pheromones, they smell that it's the right entrance, they just can't get in, and they ultimately end up joining the group of bees in this box. This process can take over a week or more because there's still larvae hatching out inside there that are going to have to find their way back out. But the good news is they consume the resources that they have in there on their way out. So it's much different than just coming and exterminating wasps, for example. So it can be a lengthy process, but you do trap them out. Here's the thing. They don't build new nests this time of year. So you're, you're trapping them out just uh, to kill the wasps. You can't relocate them and get them to restart because the queens won't do that now. So, but it works for bees. So if you look at escape cones, look at uh, trap outs, videos on things like that. Several have been done, so there's no reason for me to do one like that. And here's the final question of the day by Noah writing number 15. What's the best thing available for a bee yard that you can only visit maybe two times a month I'm finding this to be an issue because the heat spoils the sugar water. So visiting two times a month is, is fine. We're in that two to three week time zone where you need to inspect stuff. This is really simple. People want to be able to have a feeder. They can put sugar syrup in and then the sugar syrup does not spoil. So heat, everything else is just going to spoil. It's going to ferment, blah, blah, blah. So the thing is, there's a couple of things. And I've mentioned this before. I don't have any honey be healthy here. Anyway, you can take Honey Bee Healthy, if you have that, it's an essential oil, and uh, you add that to your sugar syrup and it will keep it from spoiling. I used to have a little leather thing sitting up here with my spray bottle. It lasted with Honey Bee Healthy in it for six months and did not spoil. And ultimately I took it out and used it for something else. But the fresher it is, the better it is. But definitely you can get it to last a month. So here's another thing that you can do. You can take a teaspoon of bleach. This is not bleach that has other stuff added to it. You want it to be plain bleach, nothing else, no sense, nothing else added. And you can use a teaspoon per gallon of sugar syrup. And basically it's not going to spoil all summer long. Some people when you use that method. Randy Oliver said you can use that method to sanitize drinkers and things that maybe have a lot of intricate surfaces you can't uh, take care of. So of course, the more surface area, the more airflow there is. So whatever kind of drinker you're using, that bleach is not going to last. It's going to off gas, but it will kill bacteria and prevent it from ruining your sugar syrup. And the bees don't care about it because we're at the levels that uh, the bees would find if they went to a 
chlorinated swimming pool that we all know that bees like to go and drink from. So there again, and it's proven that there's no negative impact on your bees themselves. So they'll still drink the sugar syrup. It doesn't destroy their bee gut and everything else that some people have speculated about. That did not prove to be true, but it's a teaspoon per gallon of bleach to sugar syrup. So that will keep it from spoiling. That'll help you out. So that's it for today. Thank you for watching. Thanks for being here. If you want to Make sure that you remember that you've seen this. Don't forget to click the like button down before, down below. And as part of my exit today, I just want to thank the people that wrote to me that were thanking me, or not thanking me, but congratulating me. Because this week I got the word that I passed all my exams at Cornell University's Dice Lab. So I became a master beekeeper. A lot of fun, a lot of studies, a lot of coursework. The programs were fantastic. And it just feels good to have that over with. So now I can work with my bees. But yep, now I'm a master beekeeper. So thanks, it feels great. Totally learned a lot there. Fantastic program. So thanks for watching. I hope that you have a fantastic weekend.